California was once home to the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. At its largest, it stretched about 690 square miles and was located here in the southern portion of the San Joaquin Valley. For comparison, Lake Tahoe sits at a measly 191 square miles, so needless to say, this was a pretty large body of water. And today I want to explain what caused its disappearance. It's a story about how the decisions we make can have major unintended consequences. This is the story of Tulare Lake. You may know California's Central Valley as the place where we grow almonds, grapes, tomatoes, and cotton. It is more than 400 miles long and 60 miles wide. But it didn't always used to be a flat and dry valley. Around 700,000 years ago, this entire region was submerged underwater by what historians now call Lake Corcoran. This gargantuan body of water lasted about 50,000 to 100,000 years until overflow carved an outlet through the Carquinez Strait. Much of the water drained, and in place of one giant lake, multiple smaller lakes remained. One of them being Tulare Lake. Even though Tulare Lake was smaller than Lake Corcoran, it was nothing to scoff at. Modern day towns like Corcoran and Stratford would be completely submerged underwater if they existed back then. Much of the lake's water came from the Kern, Toole, and Kawea rivers, as well as southern distributaries of the Kings River. What's interesting is how much the lake fluctuated in size over time. This was due in large part to the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges. If the mountains received a large amount of snow, the resulting melting snowpack would fill the lake to massive levels. The first inhabitants were the Native Americans, particularly the Tachi tribe, a Yokuts people. Tulare Lake provided bountiful wildlife and plants for the early inhabitants of the region. The region was so bountiful, in fact, that it had one of the highest regional populations densities in pre-contact North America. It was an incredibly biodiverse community. There were deer and elk to hunt, abundant plant life used for food and tools, and during wet years, it became the southernmost point of the Western Hemisphere's Chinook salmon run. The first white man to stumble upon the region was Don Pedro Fages, lieutenant of Catalonian volunteers. He found the valley as he was looking for deserters in the fall of 1772. Although people knew it existed, active exploration of the region didn't start until 1806 with the purpose of discovering potential mission sites, capturing or punishing runaway neophytes, or bringing converts to the padres of the coastal missions. It wasn't long before the area became an active hub of economic activity, one of which being the multiple fisheries along the lake and its extensive marshes. In 1880, over 73,000 pounds of fish were shipped from Hanford to San Francisco. What's amazing is that this all happened in only a three month period. It's hard to overstate just how bountiful this region of California was during that time. And fun fact, the lake supported western pond turtles, which people enjoyed as terrapin soup all throughout the state. The entire species is now vulnerable though, so no more eating terrapin soup. And it's not like I think you're gonna do it, but you know, I thought I'd just throw that out there. During the late 19th century, the settlements in and around Tulare Lake region began to cause problems. The construction of levees and dams used for agriculture began to reduce the flow of water into the region. This depiction from 1879 shows the beginning of the incoming years of decline. So how exactly did this decline happen? Okay, so there are four main rivers that supplied water to Tulare Lake, all of which were dammed upstream in the Sierra Nevada mountains. This turned their headwaters into a system of reservoirs where the state and counties created canals that delivered water for municipal uses and agricultural irrigation. Tulare Lake was dry by the early 20th century, only to fill up again in extremely wet years where the water would overflow and flood the basin. People speculated if the lake would ever rise again, but the final nail in the coffin for the theory was the construction of multiple dams in the middle of the 20th century. The Terminus Dam on the Kawea River, the Success Dam on the Toole River, and the Pine Flat Dam on the Kings River. What remained in its wake was a shallow basin of fertile soil that joined the most productive agricultural region in the United States. And while the agriculture of the region was used to feed the country, the destruction of the lake and its surrounding ecosystems have resulted in substantial losses of all sorts of wildlife in the region, in addition to a depleted aquifer. While the lake is now dry, there have been times where it's reappeared in cases of extreme flooding following unusually high levels of rainfall or snowmelt. This happened in both 1983 and 1997. 
So when we first recorded this video, Tulare Lake was still dry and we hadn't gone through like a million atmospheric rivers, but Tulare Lake is filling up again due to torrential rain. Uh, the resultant flooding has caused a potential agricultural crisis by making it difficult for farmers to access their land and endangering crops. We do have a plan to make a video on it. It's not this one, but stay tuned. It'll come out sometime in the future. The Bureau of Land Management now owns and manages the Tulare Lake restoration site at the Atwell Island Land Retirement Demonstration Project. Their goal is to restore native valley grassland, a wetland, and alkali sink habitats on an area that for the past century was covered by fields of cotton, oats, and alfalfa. You can visit the site and no reservations are required to do so. Tulare Lake, like Owens Lake further south, depleted in a matter of decades and remains a stark reminder of just how precious a resource water is and how decisions we make today can have major consequences in the future.